Our scripture reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Of course, here we have the record of the law of God. And we often begin in its reading in verse 6, and we're just going to read verses 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Let us give ear, beloved, and again, remember, it's not merely the words of men. This is not this Moses writing as a man. This is Moses writing as a prophet of God. God gave him the words to speak. Let us have ears to hear. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity upon the fathers, upon the children to the third and fourth generations of them who hate me, but showing mercy unto thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. What do we witness here? We read of the mercy of God poured out upon those who love him. Now, Sometimes we confuse the grace of God with the mercy of God. And the best definition that I know of these two wonderful truths is that the grace of God is when God gives you something we do not deserve. This is Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We don't hear of too many mercy churches, do we? Did you ever hear of a mercy reformed church or a mercy orthodox reformed church? I wonder why not. Isn't mercy just as important as grace? I hope that you will see that it is. Mercy, we need to understand, is when God withholds from us what we do deserve. Of course, the great question is, so we used to say, the $64,000 question for those who are dated, you know. (laughs) Mercy. Why, we could ask, is that so important? Or better, what do we deserve, to be straightforward? Do we deserve His grace? Do we deserve his favor? Do do we deserve salvation? Do we deserve any of the gifts that are given to us by the Lord our God? They don't come because we deserve them. We speak of grace because we understand every gift given to us comes freely by God's hand. It's not something we've earned. And we can say of these two great truths of grace and mercy, they're like, you know, the, the, each side of the same coin. You really don't have one without the other. If God were not merciful, he certainly wouldn't be gracious. Because if he gave us what we deserved, every single man, woman, and child would be in hell. Do we understand that, really? That's a hard concept to wrap your head around. Do I really deserve hell? I don't think our flesh is very comfortable with that. And yet, if we're honest with what Scripture teaches, it is true. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. In fact, we're, we're pictured there in Romans as being like sepulchers, empty tombs. The natural man. 
story's been told of a mother who sought from Napoleon pardon for her son. And this was the second offense. And Napoleon notes this to this mother and said to her, Justice demands your son's death. Not only has he committed this offense once, but twice. And the mother's response is very interesting. She said, I don't ask for justice. I plead for mercy. But, said the emperor, he does not deserve mercy. She cried, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And the mercy is all that I ask for him. Well then, said the emperor, I will show mercy. And her son was saved. Now, do you think that mother rejoiced over the mercy of the emperor? Of course she did. Do you rejoice over the mercy of, the, of God to you each day? We need to stop and think of this. I know I do. And think that God has been merciful to me. To give me another breath to breathe. Another day. To serve him. And to receive the love even that's in my life. Of family and friends. And all the other wonderful gifts that we possess. And. So easy just to, to think of as really deserving. We don't say that too much, but it kind of comes across that way when we're not thankful for the mercy of God. The psalmist put it this way over and over again, like a litany in Psalm 136. You know those words. Speaking of the Lord, we're to reply time and time again when the psalmist mentions God's great gifts to us. We are to reply how his mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. Why does the psalmist say it over and over and over again? Why do you say something over again? It's like Luther said. You know, if I said it once, twice, eight times, because I didn't think he got it the first time, and you really need to hear it. We really need to hear it then. As the psalmist points out, the mercy of the Lord endures forever. Because of Christ's beloved, who interposed his precious blood, we have God's everlasting mercy. He will never give us what we deserve. In other words, he never will punish us for the sins that are still plaguing us. If we are faithful to confess our sins to Christ, he will be faithful to forgive us. 1 John 1, 7. Long ago, a poor woman from the slums of, of London, England, was invited to go with a group of people for a holiday at the ocean. Now, if you've been to England, you wouldn't think that's much of a big deal because it's surrounded by ocean. But in those days, traveling, and if you were very poor, there were people who were born and spent their entire lives in London and never left, like this lady would have if it had not been for her generous friends. She had never been to the ocean before. When she saw it, you know what she did? She burst into tears. You might think that's strange. Her friends thought it strange. Why are you weeping, they asked her. Why are you crying? And she pointed at the ocean. She said, this is the only thing I've ever seen before that there was enough of. And that was a strange way to put it, but make the point this, that we need to look at the mercy of the Lord like a vast ocean. When the psalmist says the mercy of the Lord endures forever, it's endless. That's to comfort our hearts. That's to encourage us to always seek after the Lord. And know how many times we fall down, keep pressing on, cling to Him. Trust Him with your whole heart, mind, and soul. He is merciful. Satan would want to whisper in your ear, no, he's not. 
You're such a sinner. He won't forgive you. That's a lie from hell. God's mercy endures forever. And Christ ensured that very thing. The Son of God was willing to go to the cross for us. The one who was sinless, harmless. As John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God has oceans of mercy, beloved. Sometimes we, we fear it like we fear a tsunami. We ought not to. His mercy doesn't destroy us. It overwhelms us with the knowledge of his love. God delights to show his mercy. What does it say? Right here in the law of God, and often it's, you know, it, it, it's strange the way the law of God is perceived. It's thought to be this harsh, you know, almost screaming from Mount Sinai of God through Moses. These terrible Ten Commandments. But in this commandment we see God shows mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. That is, treasure them. doesn't mean obey them perfectly. It means we treasure his law. Oh, how love I thy law, said the psalmist. It is my meditation, the day and night. Apostle John said, his commandments are not grievous to us. We can delight in them. In them is the gospel. There's good news there. For he has fulfilled all righteousness for us. Micah said, Micah 7, 19, He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. We will cast, or he will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. That's what his mercy is like. Swallows up all the, the, the depths and the darkness of our own sin. God delights in showing mercy. Prophet Hosea said, And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them who are not my people, Thou art my people. And they shall say, Thou art my God. Oh, I can remember clearly in my life when there's a time when I was saying, He's not my God. And I was running from him, fleeing from him. But when I tasted of his mercy, that he would withhold his wrath against me because of Christ, then I could cry out, you are my God. There's no one else worthy and nothing else worthy of all my affection but you, O oh Lord. No longer am I to love the things of this world which are passing. That's why John warns us, doesn't he, clearly? Love not the things of the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It crowds it out. Now easy it is for you and me to love the things of this world. It's one of the things I love about going on mission trips is that I love going among the poorest of the poor to remind me of my own poverty of how I am without Christ. Without Christ, I am the poorest of the poor. But with Christ, I have the riches. And I see some of the poorest people on the earth have the richest joy because they know the Lord and they received his mercy. And it's not because of things. They don't have things. But we can have Christ. We can say of him, he is our God. He is our Savior. Daniel prayed to the Lord, my God, he did. And he made his confession. And he said, O oh Lord, great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Right out of the law of Moses. Of course, we can ask, why does God need to reveal this attribute? Well, it's, it's just 
totally necessary to our own being to know him in such a way. You think in Matthew 25, you think of that passage. Matthew 25, following the, it's really the end of his lengthy sermon there that began in chapter 23, it's recorded. But he gives, you don't want to call them three parables because the third's not a parable, but it begins with the parable of the ten virgins, you'll recall. And they were to trim their lamps. Five did, five didn't. And those who didn't were left wanting when the bridegroom returned. But the second one is the parable of the talents. Recall that? And to one he gave five, another two, another he gave one. And the guy with five went out and multiplied him. Same with the guy with two, but the guy with one didn't. But what's so significant there is the response to him by the Lord about this whole matter of what of why he didn't take that talent and of make it of a great use. Let me get to that. Matthew chapter 25. And in particular, it's verse, verses 24 and 25. This is the Lord's reply to this fellow. When he comes back and he, he just took that one talent, what did he do with it? You recall, he hid it, didn't he? He just buried it and did absolutely nothing with it. And it says in the one, so he who had received the one talent came and said, now listen what he says to God. Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping what you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there is what is yours. Do you understand? You know, what a portrayal of human nature. In, in the unsaved person, a person that doesn't know God, accuses him of being hard and harsh and unkind. Rather than knowing the one who knows God, knows that's not the case at all. The fact that God gave you the talent in the first place should have been enough to show you how kind and merciful he was. But that servant missed it totally. And he was really dealing with God as though he was deserving of God's kindness and mercy. He did not know the Lord. The Lord is not hard. The Lord is not one who reaps where he has not sown. Actually accusing him to be like a thief. When God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And gathering where you have not scattered seed. Why do we have sunshine? Why do we have rain? Why do we have the elements that we count on? Because God orders them all. He is indeed merciful. We don't have a right perception of God, naturally. We don't have a right perception even of ourselves, if you will. Let me illustrate this. The story is told of a politician who, after receiving the proofs of his portrait, Politicians love portraits of themselves. He was very angry with the photographer. And he stormed back to the photographer and he arrived with these angry words. He says, this picture does not do me justice. And the photographer replied, sir, with a face like yours, you don't need justice. You need mercy. It makes a point about ourselves, though, doesn't it? Yeah, why do we so often, we're in a battle to argue with God about justice? Oh, why doesn't you, you hear, why doesn't God save everybody? He, he can't be just. You want to argue with God on justice? You want him to take away his mercy? Where he withholds his wrath to you and I who are condemned criminals? in essence, because of the law. 
No, we don't want that at all. We would cry out, mercy, O oh Lord. Do not give me what I deserve. We look in the mirror and see ourselves as the word of God portrays us. The natural man is not very attractive at all. But let us see God for who he is. And God is rich in mercy. He has it abundantly. And the mercy of the Lord truly endures forever. But here in the text, simply in verse 10, it says, He is showing mercy unto thousands. The point being that it's, it's boundless. When you say thousands, it's not ending the number. It's not making it small and insignificant. It doesn't mean that millions can't be saved. That's not the point. The languages say, in, in essence, there's, there's no restriction. If you love the Lord as your God and your Savior, His mercy is yours forever. Listen to some of the texts from the Psalms. Psalm 36, verse 5. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Psalm 89, verse 1, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 103, verse 4, He redeems my life from destruction. He crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. Psalm 138, verse 8, The Lord will be perfect. That which concern, that with that which concerns me, thy mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Forsake not the work of your own hands. Are you a child of God? Are you a Christian? And experiencing even that new birth. Do you know that was not only a, by the grace of God, but it's by the mercy of God. Salvation doesn't come only by grace alone. That's not the meaning when we confess it as one of the great solas of the Reformation. There are other things as well. Listen to Peter and how he put it. First Peter 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are saved by mercy just as we're saved by grace. You can't take away either one. Matthew Henry put it this way. The best of men owe their best blessings to the abundant mercy of God. All the evil in this world is from man's sin. But all the good in it is from God's mercy. Regeneration is expressly ascribed to the abundant mercy of God. And so are all the rest. We subsist entirely upon divine mercy. Boy, it's hard to beat Matthew Henry. So I keep going back to him and back to him. How succinctly and wonderfully said, the abundant mercy of God, a wellspring and source of God's goodness to you and me. And then note also under thousands, you think of the tender words in the, of the psalmist in Psalm 103, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. And then in verse 17, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. God's mercy is without limit as well as his grace. Oh, how we are so quick to limit God. We see people sometimes and we think, oh, it's like, could they possibly be saved? I look in the mirror and have to say that every day. It's only by God's being merciful to me 
withholding from me what I really deserve. I don't deserve his grace. I don't deserve his mercy. It's only because of God and who he is that I have a saving relationship with him. We're adopted into the family of God. We're not naturally children. We don't possess, you know, a, a, a birthright that is our true inheritance. It's given by a gift. It's given undeservedly to you and me. Well, the third point is that God is especially merciful to his people. Those who love him. Now, it is our misery, in a sense, that calls forth God's mercy. A parent knows how this is. When a child is suffering from some illness, I remember our firstborn, our son, Josiah, and he got scarlet fever when he was just, I don't know how many months old, a year old, or maybe just, just a, a, a child. And it, to see him so sick, it just tears your heart out. You remember that? As those who are parents, the first time you saw one of your children sick, how there's just no feeling like it. What it does to your heart to see that. And I knew so many things come to my mind. Oh, all the pain I'd caused my own parents. Not just from sickness, but from some of my willful sin. You see your child, and what do you do? Sometimes it's, you feel helpless. All you can do is throw your arms around their neck and embrace them. And try to soothe them. and Tell them how much you love them. It awakens a deep, heartfelt pity, doesn't it? And you reach out and you try to relieve the child's distress in any possible way you can. Why? Because his misery, his pain of that circumstance, calls forth your mercy. And this is how God looks upon us. It is his character to be merciful. That's not a strange attribute for him. That is his attribute. Our God is merciful. Hold on to that. And share that with the world around you. This generation, every generation, needs to know of the mercy of God. Many people know their lives are a wreck and that they've made a mess of them. But they still need to know God's mercy. They're still made in his image. No matter how badly that image may be marred, and we can look quite reprehensible at times. I'm sure for my conservative southern parents, it was a little strange for them to see their son come home with hair down to his waist. I did once. Yeah, I survived the 60s. We were talking about that at lunch. Or even worse, to have my name on the front page of the largest weekly newspaper, War Hero Goes to Jail, and my picture in a jail uniform, you see. Did it invoke from my parents' wrath? No. It broke their hearts. Why? Because they loved me, no matter what place I was in. And God loves us even more and better and more pure. God is merciful. His response to our reaching out to him in love is to love us in return. Not giving us what we deserve, but graciously dealing with us in mercy. Luke 150, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Let's go to the cross. Let's, let's see Jesus with his company of thieves and the mercy he bestows upon them. He could have condemned them there and given them no hope, but what does he do? He reaches out to them. And the one who responds, he says, today you will see me in paradise. You'll be with me. And how about for the rest of humanity? 
Father, forgive them. He looks upon those at the foot of the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We don't realize the depth of our sin against the holy God. We know not what we do. Micah again, who is a God like you? Micah 7, 18. Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in his mercy. May God fill your hearts with the knowledge of his love to respond in the same way, to love him for who he is. He is worthy of all our love and praise and adoration. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's pray.